But uh, we mentioned uh, last time that uh, one of the big ideas is that um, hazard is, is the term that we use for a potential threat, so something that could cause us an issue. So uh, a hill that might, the soil might be unstable, so that might, that, that's a potential landslide hazard, right? Or if we live in, um, along the San Andreas Fault, we have a potential earthquake hazard, right? So that's the, that's the potential, it, there's a, a potential for that particular type of event to play out. Um, once that event plays out and causes you or me some harm, that is when we use the term disaster. So hazard and disaster sometimes are used interchangeably, but hazard is really before the event happens, disaster is after it happens and, and, and demonstrates conspicuous uh, bad things. Um, as we'll begin to talk about this semester, the bureaucracy that's been built, that, that has evolved around this is, is very thick. It's, it's hard to crack the nut. So we'll talk about this, but, but just to, to, starter, to start off, understand there is a lot of terminology that, that people seem to get bogged down in and really, really want to make sure they use the right term. And, and this, this international group uses that term for it, and then the FEMA uses a different term for it, and you know, so it, it, gets, it gets, can be a little crazy. We talked a little bit about the wildfires um, in uh, there. I showed the wrong video for you guys. Um, I think I didn't even update it, so this is still the wrong video. But um, but this one was about water quality. I was trying to show you one about homeless uh, folks. But suffice it to say, um, uh, I'll, I'll have that feed up for you uh, guys. But basically, um, uh, in this case, housing was already a problem before the Maui wildfires, and it's only gotten even crazier and crazier since. So now we have folks living. Um, you know, homeless encampments um, uh, on the beaches in, in and around Maui, including right in front of some of the big ultra fancy high-end hotels um, as sort of a bit of a middle finger to the, the policies that have not uh, allowed folks to have um, affordable housing and stuff. Um, uh, we talked about uh, uh, this uh, coming together event. We'll talk more about it later. Um, and we talked about how easy it is to get, um, especially in today's day and age, angry with one another. And so this was from uh, last Saturday, as I mentioned, this was a, an elder, uh, one of the master um, uh, oceanic voyagers, uh, Hawaiian voyagers, was talking and this lady uh, got up and interrupted him and said, and then this was essentially the first time the community came together, you know, in five, almost six months um, after the fire to sort of heal and just sort of, you know, give each other hugs and say what's up, um, and be in community with each other, which is very, very important. Um, and she got up and said, this is not a time for that. This is a time to go to war, basically, with, with people. Um, and so, so it, it, it's, it's very easy to have post-disaster things go bad. And it's very easy for there to not be recovery after, after a disaster if we're not working out together. OK, so, here's, uh, so that's kind of where we ended on, on Monday. Any questions about that stuff so far? Making sense? I should also say, you guys interrupt me whenever, right? Interrupt me whenever. So I'll have, the, I'll have these lectures I'm, I'll be trying to get through so that we can get onto some other stuff. Uh, so sometimes I might go fast. You should, hey, Dr. Ray, raise your hand, cut me off. I didn't understand that. I'm wondering about X. I'm wondering about Y. Um, absolutely. Totally do that. So, so just because I'm talking, that doesn't mean you guys have to be quiet. Cool? Is that a deal? Ah, is that a deal? Whoa, geez, everybody's, uh, it's 9 o'clock. I thought people would be more awake. I, just thought, I didn't make it at 8. I thought you guys would have another hour of sleep and be up more energy. Okay, so a uh, couple examples of, of, uh, of some of this terminology. Um, so a hazard, as we mentioned, is, is the potential thing, right? So something that has, the, that might cause a problem. It's not causing a problem right now, but has the potential to cause a problem. And so this is United Nations... World Health Organization terminology. Um, and so they say a hazard is a process, phenomenon, or human activity that may cause loss of life uh, or, or injury or property damage, um, something of that nature. So that's a hazard. Okay, cool. All right. Then we get risk. So risk, according to the, the WHO, isn't risk to the environment per se. 
it's risk to humans. And so risk specifically is the potential for loss of life or, or casualties, meaning an injury, um, should this thing happen, should this event play out. So hazard is the actual thing, risk is the, is the probability of that happening. Okay, then we get to, then maybe the thing actually happens. So then maybe the hazard actually occurs, the storm actually comes in, the storm, storm rolls through our town, okay? And um, just because the storm comes through, we don't call that a disaster. There has to be some significant impact. And so um, in terms of the WHO's terminology, they talk about a serious disruption of functioning either at the, at the community or the societal scale. Uh, uh, that's directly attributable to this, this um, hazard. So that, so, you know, storm comes through, we wouldn't call it a disaster. Storm comes through, knocks out the power, people don't have lights, uh, 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 and they go back on after, you know, I don't know, a minute or two, again, not a disaster. But if they stay off for a while, if we have to get, you know, grandma to a hotel or something like that, that's when we start talking about disasters. It's a fuzzy thing. So if, if my grandma got displaced and she was the only one in the whole town, is that a disaster? Eh, probably not. If there were a thousand grandmas displaced, yeah, that's a disaster. But what's the exact number between one and a thousand? There's a bit of a judgment call there. And that's gonna depend on the society. That's gonna depend on the, on the setting, right? And so, so wealthier countries will tend to have a lot more tolerance and, and, and good infrastructure countries will tend to have a lot more tolerance for what triggers a disaster. But, but conceptually, that's, that's what the disaster is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then an incident is um, uh, something that is all this stuff together, basically. Um, and and, the, and a, a hazardous event is something that's sort of all this stuff together over a discrete period of time. So another issue that will come up, that will start to come up. So just like what triggers something to be a, it, you know, is, is this particular thing that happened on Tuesday, is this a disaster or not? There's a little bit of a judgment call. The other thing that's, that's really, really important for you all to understand, especially as ESRM folks, is, um, is, is the timing. So we always talk about the date the, the um, hurricane made landfall. We talk about the date the shaking started of the earthquake. We talk about um, the day the, fi the first flame was, you know, the spark of the flame that started the wildfire, right? And that makes total sense. Of course, we should use those dates. We'll typically talk about, well, the hurricane started on Tuesday and was out of here by Wednesday. Or the wildfire started on Monday and it concluded two weeks from from that Monday, right? So that is really the primary disaster. That, 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 that's the, the, the you know, put stuff you put on television, right? And that stuff makes the evening news. And that, that's important and that's real. Just like it can be hard to define um, if something is or not a, um, a disaster, it can also be hard to define when a disaster ends, right? And so um, part of that is because there's a whole process that we go through, but also there's things that are just hard to understand. So um, uh, many of my friends that uh, we've partnered with for years in uh, New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, and then in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon uh, blowout, um, uh, passed away during COVID. Um, and, you know, Maybe it was COVID or whatever, but, but a lot of that was likely because of the stress that people had built up. There's so much stress. There's all kinds of things. Domestic violence, um, divorce, um, um, people declaring bankruptcy, all these kinds of things that come on, but might take some time. So we were just in New Orleans before Christmas mapping one of our restoration sites, and there was you know, yet another cypress tree that was you know, 30 meters tall that was you know, at about 20 degree angle. So that sucker was in the process. That sucker is in the process of falling down. So um, that that storm happened in 2005. So you know we're talking almost 20 years ago, um, but we're still seeing the tail end of that, right? So if we'd had an intact forest, that big giant tree would not 
be falling down right now. It maybe might bump into another tree, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't fall down. So, so the timing of the event can also be amorphous, even though we'll typically talk about the primary event went from day X to day Y. So just understand there is this fuzziness in terms of, of the magnitude, and there is this fuzziness in terms of duration. Um, and, and many of those things, when we talk about the long tail of a disaster, are very, very difficult to quantify. So, so did that guy beat his wife because of the hurricane? Or was it but, but, was it but a you know, contributing factor? Um, you know, all these things, it, it, gets, it gets hard to analyze. But intellectually, we know that there are ecological and social consequences that can go for years after these things, even after the apparent um, you know, conspicuous damage has been healed. OK. Um, in general, uh, there, I, I, again, I don't want to get too lost in the terminology. But we need to have a little bit of terminology. So um, when we have that storm that comes in that I mentioned, so, so let, let's use these terms for us for going forward. So we have something, we don't have to worry about comparing the FEMA definition to this, to that, to whatever. So, so um, uh, that storm I said that came through, the, came through the, our house or came through our, our, our county and maybe grandma had to go to a hotel because her house flooded, let's say that, okay? We would call that a, an emergency. Right, that was a problem for grandma. It's a real problem. I'm not trying to minimize it. Of course, if that happens to you, it's, it sucks and it's horrible and everything. But we call it maybe a uh, that hazard manifests as an emergency. Only when it's affecting more people, again, not a clear definition, but more people, that would kick it into a disaster. And then when we have something like um, uh, Hurricane Katrina or like the Maui wildfires, Something like that that really is, is, is a huge deal that's affecting many, many components of society or, or a very broad region, then we would use the term maybe a catastrophe. So if an earthquake hits downtown LA, that ain't going to be a disaster. That's going to be a catastrophe kind of thing. Cool? So we have kind of a little bit of problem to a more quote unquote typical disaster to a insane, crazy, horrible thing that's going to take years and years and years just to even do the basic recovery from. Okay. Another key one here that, that comes up a lot is, is you know, uh, disasters. The, often the, the phrase is natural disasters. And so let's talk a little bit about natural versus human cause. And historically, this, these have been a very clear delineation. Uh, earthquake, natural disaster. Hurricane, natural disaster, right? That kind of thing. Um, a natural disaster is some, something that where the latent property or the inherent capability of the environment is the thing doing the damage or, or, or having the impact. Uh, anthropogenic is something that is entirely or at least vast, 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 vast majority people caused. So... Um, uh, what are some examples of traditional natural disasters? That would be something like um, biological or abio abiotic stuff. So biological would be something like a um, locust outbreak. Like every, you know, say 19 years, the locusts come out and they just mow all the wheat crop and all of a sudden there's no food and that kind of stuff. So that, that, that could be, a nat that could be, you could call that, classify that as a natural um, uh, hazard or an, after it happens, a natural disaster. Um, and then the things we typically think of, the geophysical, the shaking of the ground, that type of stuff. Hydro, hydrometeorological, this would be our flooding, uh, you know, crazy snow events or something like that. Or a big giant uh, asteroid comes down and smashes into the earth, that kind of thing. Um, uh, an anthropogenic hazard, or after it happens, disaster, would be something like um, uh, an oil spill, right? So, so we, we could imagine an oil spill and a hurricane potentially could have this uh, similar impact on, let's say, a salt marsh, <coughs> right? It might kill the plants and, and knock everything down or whatever. But, but one would be driven by humans, one would be driven by people. Uh, another example would be um, like the, uh, palace, like the um, uh, train derailment that we saw that spilled a bunch of vinyl chloride, right? Or a chemical spill, something of that nature. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, I'll just say that, how we do it on time. Yeah. Um, okay, 
So another, I think probably the most useful framework for, for categorizing the types of disasters and the types of hazards <laughs> is this thing called the Sendai uh, framework. Um, and uh, for political choices, they've excluded things like humanitarian crises, um, even though oftentimes these things are hard to distinguish, but, but I'll just say that. So, um, oh, so this was something we we're gonna do. I think I have this over here. Yeah, so this, oh no, I have it, have it over here. So this is the Sendai framework right here. So this is, um, I think, probably the most sort of well thought out in terms of, uh, you know, people trying to poke holes in it and change it and modify it. Um, and so this is, uh, at, at the highest level, it's broken up into natural stuff versus human-induced um, versus environmental, which are kind of this sort of betwixt between those two things. And so again, we have the geophysical, the earthquakes, stuff like that. The hydrometeorological, the flooding. The biological, like a disease outbreak. Something like a meteorite or asteroid strike in the Earth. And then we have the technological, which would be something that we, that we did uh, and is, you could maybe, you could, you could consider an engineering failure. So the, the pipeline broke and the oil came out. The, the chemical plant, we, we incorrectly mixed the, the chemicals in it and it spilled and made a big gaseous thing, yeah. Yes, so that, that would be, that would, in, the, in this framework, that would be a technological one, yeah, totally. Versus, versus something like armed conflict, like terrorism, right? So ter again, these things might have the same outcome ecologically or the same outcome um, in terms of the economy of the area, right? But, but, um, but they're broken out differently. Um, and then lastly, we have this one that's environmental degradation, which again, as I said, is kind of the, these two things together. So, so it's, it's the environment doing its environment thing, but, it's, but we've been doing something indirectly that's leading us up. So leading to soil erosion, which is leading into the, the filling in of the chant of the river. And so now it doesn't have as much capacity to hold water, so it does rent, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's an example of these frameworks. Um, and so this is gonna set up uh, one of our activities next week, but um, uh, how we've thought about disasters uh, historically is one of the reasons we use the term natural disasters because it's not us, right? It's like, oh, I didn't do anything, it's just a so-called act of God, right? So beyond us, it was just, couldn't have predicted it, totally, had nothing to do with us, it was like a random event of the universe kind of thing. Um, and so that, that's how we have historically talked about these events. Um, uh, by the 19th and 20th centuries, we start to not talk about God being angry with us or, or, or the gods being pissed and wrecking retribution. But we start to talk about um, a, a serious disruption in something in society uh, that we had little or no warning about. And we just, we just, uh, we, we couldn't understand it. So we, we, we weren't talking about acts of God as much, but we were talking about something that we didn't understand. Um, now, I think the most common way to talk about disasters is actually to understand that we, if, if we didn't, you know, humans aren't, aren't out there starting a hurricane, per se, but um, with almost all of these disasters that we have now, even if they were caused by a non-human spark or a non-human um, um, initiator, our choices have made the impacts much worse, right? So our choices of lining the, the river with concrete, right, have made the flooding more crazy. Our choices of, of building in, wild, in, in very burnable grasslands or oak woodlands or whatever makes us more vulnerable to fires, that, that kind of thing. So, so we've, we've gone from this, this 
original era of don't know what's going on, oh my god, we're just little pawns, to well, stuff's going on, but it's just beyond us to understand how it's going on, to now really understanding that our influence looms very large in terms of how these things play out, et cetera. Um, and indeed, while we won't talk about it much in this class, uh, just in the last 20 years, a whole new branch of science has grown up called attribution science. And attribution science is sort of an interdisciplinary, um, not sort of, it is an interdisciplinary approach. It takes meteorology and, and uh, uh, economics and all these things together to um, understand the likelihood that this event would have happened in the first place or would have been as bad as it was if we had not been doing our actions. And so attribution science really grew up primarily around climate change. So um, when it seems, so, so, so for example, Hurricane Katrina, um, in a sense, it doesn't matter what caused Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina in 2005 was absolutely a foreshadowing of the coming century, right? So we're gonna see a lot more disasters like that. Um, how it played out, how the most disenfranchised bearing the greatest burden, all these, all these things. Um, and it was almost, I would argue, almost secondary if we caused it or didn't cause it. Back then when that happened, we couldn't really say. So, so back then in, in the early 2000s, it was like, yeah, it's more like, probably more likely that, that, that this happened, but of course we've had hurricanes forever, right? Um, now, attribution science has gotten so sophisticated, we can often get uh, at least an initial answer within hours or days. So when the disaster is still playing out. And that's been really important to, um, to help drive policy to deal with things like climate change. So that, yes, yes, we, we don't know if this particular hurricane striking this particular city was caused by climate change, but we, we do know, or we, we can say that that um, this hurricane was 200% um, uh, time more likely to be problematic than if we'd not, be, not been pumping out a gazillion million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, or if we'd not uh, changed the, f the flooding on the floodplain or, or whatever it was. So, so we've sort of had this movement on conceptualizing disasters for something beyond, we, something we can even conceive of to now understand that we, if not, if not the mayor player, major player, we are a major player in determining how, how um, these things play out. Um, so I already mentioned this, this framework. Um, and so the key things that we will um, touch on this semester are gonna be earthquakes and its sister tsunamis, which is sort of the consequence of an earthquake in a large water body. Earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, volcanoes. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, I, so, yeah. All of these things um, we potentially can experience here in California. Um, some are more likely than others, but all are potentially possible. So a few years ago, in one of the most recent eruptions um, on the Big Island of Hawaii, it was happening. Um, uh, there was a big concern over VOG, which is like fog, but instead of, instead of just sort of dust and whatever. It, it's chunks, little chunks of uh, super sharp glass from the erupted volcano. And so it looks like fog, but if you inhale it, it can like cut your lungs up and stuff. So, so I was talking to this reporter and they're asking questions and we we're talking about air quality and all this kind of stuff. And then the reporter said, um, yeah, but we don't have any, uh, vol what's the risk of a volcano happening here, like in downtown Santa Barbara? And I said, zero. Like we're not gonna have a, we're not gonna have a lava eruption and we're not gonna have a, a volcano go off in downtown Santa Barbara, and and of course that's you know you talk to the reporter for forty five minutes and that's like the like lead quote, yes there is no volcano in Santa Barbara, and um, I'll just say yeah it's good to know yeah thank God I was so worried, uh, but um, right afterwards I got a call from a colleague who's a geologist, and this person said. You shouldn't be talking to the media. You're totally responsible. Um, uh, you need to like blah blah blah. Don't speak about what you don't know about and everything. I was like, what? And so this person was saying, we have all kinds of volcanic activity around California, which we do, um, and it's true. 
Um, but, but what I was responding to was an irrational fear that can this happen to us? And the answer is no, it's not gonna. And I was right. There has not been a volcano in downtown Santa Barbara. Shocker. Um, uh, but it is the case that there is volcanic activity all over the place. It's just extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely that anything like that would ever happen in our lifetime and whatever. So, so um, yeah, I'll just say that. And I won't rant on about that, that guy anymore. Okay, so, um, so we have earth, earth, we'll talk about earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, volcanoes, uh, flooding, and I'll distinguish between um, rivering flooding and coastal flooding. So coastal flooding is, is mostly driven by sea level rise and, and, and um, sort of far away, for us, tropical storms and things like that, versus rivering flooding is mostly coming from rainfall events and because of our development in and around the watershed uh, of that particular area. So they might look the same, they might produce the same response, but they're, they're, they're different in important ways. Um, and then uh, uh, tropical storms, which when they spin very, very fast, we have special names to them. We call them uh, hurricanes um, uh, in our part of the world, or we call them cyclones in other parts of the world. Um, and then a lot of time on fire and drought, the things we mo probably mostly think of in terms of our hazards here. But then other things like um, vector-borne diseases. We've, we've uh, you know, COVID was a shock to a lot of people. Um, and then uh, not a huge amount of time, but we will touch on uh, chemical spills, radiation. Um, uh, radiation is increasingly a worry with things like um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and things of that nature. But so, so we'll talk about that. And then a lot, of, and then while well, there's many things we could talk about, we'll run out of time. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely touch on sea level rise as something that's sort of complicating a lot of these things. Most conspicuously, the coastal flooding, but other things as well. Yeah. So I'll just say that uh, in the last five minutes here, we'll, we'll just do a little quick start just to give you a flavor. You don't, you don't have to write this down, but just maybe have a look at this just so you guys can get a sense of when we, do, when we eventually get to talking about actual disasters, this is the kind of stuff we'll talk about. So in this case, this, is, um, this was a human-caused thing, an anthropogenic one, right? So in this case, this was um, these folks uh, uh, carrying explosives around, shipping explosives around. This is basically World, one, World War I era. And uh, uh, they basically handled it incorrectly, and it blew up, basically. So when we talk about this, we'll talk about, the, we'll talk about where it happened, what the location is, um, and uh, you know, when, when it happened, in this case, December 6, 1917. And then we'll talk about what actually played out the primary disaster. In this case, it was a big, massive explosion. It knocked down buildings as far as you know, almost, almost a kilometer away. Um, it killed about 2,000 people which in this small town was about a fifth of all the people that were alive in that place, and injured an additional almost 10,000 people. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and then the response that came along. And so uh, one of the things that happened was um, uh, this, uh, it became the, one of the first modern, what we say, you know, kind of study with a modern eye, academic research about the causes of the disaster. So this was the sort of first toe in the water of being a bit less than, oh, it's an act of God, or somebody randomly didn't know what was going on, but to actually study and what caused it. What were the drivers? What was the setting that allowed this thing to become a problem? And this would become the foundation of modern disaster management. Other key uh, things that, that um, we can, I'll, I'll just highlight, and then maybe we'll stop here, for, but, but uh, just some examples of all things that have influenced our thinking about disasters um, and, and have influenced how we approach disasters. So Mount Vesuvius blows up all the time, but the most famous one that is in all your history tech, textbook and everything is 79 AD um, when it blew up. And this was really the birth of the modern study of volcanoes when this happened. Um, uh, plenty of the elder dies, plenty of the younger is the guy that writes about it. Um, so it's like the first time we have like a, a, a record as to, of an eyewitness as, as to what was going on with one of these things. Um, a bunch of uh, earthquakes uh, in, uh, in Italy in 1783 were really important. Uh, another earthquake um, uh, in 1857 really starts us on this way of measuring how much it shakes. So is it a lot of shaking or a little shaking or whatever? And oh my gosh, 
we start to realize that, that the amount of shaking right near the, what we now call the epicenter of the earthquake is more than the shaking that's farther away. So, so that sort of starts us down this whole earthquake science route. Um, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 burned up mostly wooden buildings at the time. Uh, really uh, crystallizes the understanding that we need what we would now call fire departments. Before it used to just be volunteers. And before if there was a fire, if we were in the city and there was a fire, you, I'd go like, hey you guys, get your buckets! And we could talk to our neighbors and get some buckets and that wasn't, that clearly wasn't very effective. And so the idea is we have to have a more systemic, more robust response to deal with, in this case, fire. Um, the Krakatoa explosion was, I think, the loudest, I, th I still think it is the loudest sound ever on Earth, at least that we know of on Earth. Um, and this was, uh, you know, in Java, this big giant, um, you know, Southeast Asia, boom, explosion that was just massive. Um, and, and this is, uh, and, and because the Br British Empire was going at the time, the Royal Society spends a lot of time studying this. And the, and the British use their global network of empire to actually help map the sound, help map the impact, and all this kind of stuff. So, so that was a, a sort of global, almost like a global, even though it's the British doing it, it was almost a global uh, effort. Um, the 1900 Galveston hurricane, which was before we started naming hurricanes, like Katrina, Ike, all this kind of stuff. So this, so this is just called the 1900 Galveston earthquake. Uh, excuse me, hurricane. Um, massive change. It, at the time was the deadliest U.S. disaster. It led to the birth of the Weather Service, the U.S. Weather Service, um, and, uh, and, and was just massive. So, so that's why, uh, and this will probably be disappointing to you guys, but, but I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. This is why the Dallas Cowboys are where they are. So up to this point, Galveston, which is this town in, in, in the, the Galveston Bay, in the water, on, an, on a little sand island, in the state of Texas, the whole thing is wiped off the face of the earth. And it had opera houses, it was the, it was the political powerhouse, it was where all the bankers were. That ends, and everybody picks up stakes and moves to Houston and to Dallas. And that city has never recovered. Um, literally the whole city is scraped, it is just knocked down. Um, just dead people for, uh, for days and days and days and days and days. Um, closer to home, the San Francisco earthquake, 1906, was really, really impactful. We, we, we talk about the San Francisco earthquake, but really most of the death and most of the economic badness came from the resulting fire that came in the wake of the hurricane. Hurricane broke all the water mains, people couldn't put out fires, and it just burned for days. It was really, really horrible. Um, so actually to this day, if you go to, um, if you go to San Francisco, and you go visit Coit Tower, that is a monument to the firefighters. So that, that, that sort of iconic sort of tower is actually shaped like a fire hose, is why it looks the way it does. So um, talk about the, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, that 1917, the sort of birth of modern disaster studies in the wake of this munition expo explosion. Uh, the 1927 Mississippi River floods were massively devastating and led to the beginning of of our modern screwing in a massive scale with hydrology across our country. So people said, never again, we can't have flooding. Flooding is bad, nature is bad. We should determine what happens with our, and that's when we started building our dams, that's when we started channelizing the Mississippi River and, and all these other things. So that was a hugely impactful thing. And then we'll just end with the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl, probably the greatest environmental catastrophe that struck our country. Um, that we don't really talk about, right? And so, um, so we talk about Deepwater Horizon, we talk about all these things which are very, very problematic and huge, hugely uh, challenging thing. But the Dust Bowl is, what, is why California looks the way it does. So the Dust Bowl, the term, oh, we get the term like Okies, that, 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 those are essentially refugees from Oklahoma and sort of Texas Panhandle, those areas come out. Uh, the Grapes of Wrath has written about this, um, all this stuff. And this really foreshadows what we're talking about now and going forward, which is bad choices lead to problems and then those folks become refugees and those refugees go somewhere and then people start saying, who are these smelly people? Like, they aren't from here, they don't look like me, they don't talk like me, and what the hell? And for the, people are always cool in the first little bit, but then once more and more people come, 
people start to, you know, elect racist presidents and stuff like that, right? And it's like, hey, we're gonna, this person will take care of this problem. Europe, Australia, uh, China, um, uh, us. I mean, it, it, this, this is a phenomenon of human society. And so, so this Dust Bowl was really the first modern foreshadowing of that. It's environmental disaster that leads to refugees that then cause pr societal pressure where those refugees seek refuge. Um, and so that's part of disasters too. Cool? All right, so I've probably gone a little bit over, so I'll, I'll pause. We'll pick this up next week. Please do um, run through the first, uh, first few modules there, and then we'll be all caught up. And then next week, this Saturday, we'll start on week two module, or, or, or module two. So I have a module zero, and then I have a module one, if you guys could go through both those. Again, if something's not right, poke me. If you didn't get an invite to, to um, scoop it or to uh, Slack or anything, you guys can come up now and talk to me, or you can just uh, poke me. Awesome. Thanks, guys.